Hey, what's up, guys? This is Gavin Shaw of the Locked On Knicks podcast. The New York Knicks fall 110 to 98 to the Brooklyn Nets. I will talk about OB Toppin's emergence, why he is officially the Knicks power forward of the future, a mixed night for RJ Barrett, and some more coaching and play style follies for the Knicks, allowing them to blow a 20 point lead and answer some of your questions. All that and more next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. And we want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today. And every day we are now available on all platforms, including, and you may know this already, but if you don't, on YouTube. So if you haven't yet, please go check out our YouTube channel. Throw us a like, throw us a, a subscription, and throw us some comments. Uh, it makes a big difference. I am Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster. Got some Long Island lacrosse with some of the best teams in the country coming up this week um, on Varsity Media. So certainly go check that out. My usual co-host is Alex Wolf. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of the Strickland, but uh, he is the day off. So it is just me today to take you through a pack-breaking loss to the Brooklyn Nets. And if this was a little bit earlier in the season, I think the focus of this podcast would be how the Knicks blew yet another 20-point lead, how it had sort of like, it's kind of like how a horror movie pretty much always has the same tropes. Um, The Knicks' personal horror movies this year have always sort of had the same tropes. Things slow down in the second half. Um, R.J. Barrett or Julius Randle, whoever the number one guy is on that night, starts to get a little bit inefficient, starts to lose a little bit of that verve that defined them in the first half. The offense loses any semblance of creativity and devolves into iso ball. And it just sort of feels like the Knicks are trying to run out the clock. And when you're in the NBA and you're playing against the most talented guys in the world, particularly when two of literally the most talented guys, maybe in the history of this sport, uh, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are on the other side of things. Uh, You don't get to do that. And when the basketball game and the Knicks, who scored 67 points in the first half and just 29, and that is an ugly, ugly number, in the second, uh, were, or excuse me, 31 in the second, still ugly, um, were unable to uh, do that and still win the basketball game. But given that this season is, is long gone and well over, I am going to focus on a different topic to start things off, and that is a much more optimistic one. It is the fact that OB Toppin over these last three games, really over the last 10 to 12 games, and maybe if he'd played a little bit more over the course of the entire season, um, has has made it very clear that he, not Julius Randle, is the Knicks power forward of the future. Obi in this game um, finished the afternoon, or finished in the afternoon, Jesus, really early in the morning, uh, finished the night with 19 points, five rebounds, three assists, three blocks, seven of 13 from the field, two of four from three, three of six from the foul line. And, I think it's continued a recent trend for Obi where he has shown or he continues to show in larger minutes the elements of his game that define his success coming off the bench. The ability to run the floor and his athleticism, I think, being chief amongst them. We, we see it game after game after game where Obi will sprint out after a miss. And I think what usually stands out to people are the dunks, right? When, when IQ just whips him a dime. 60 feet down the court, and Obi catches and finishes. What stood out to me recently is when Obi runs that hard, most bigs just can't keep up with him. And in turn, he usually ends up with a guard on him. And then Obi has gotten so good, this is kind of an old school big man skill, at getting a seal on the guard. So basically like shoving his ass into him, creating a passing opening. And Emmanuel quickly, and in this game, Alec Burks, and at times Evan Fournier, I've gotten really good at just lofting the ball over the top and it's either a layup or a foul essentially every time that is created purely by OB speed and hustle. But then the athleticism around the rim, we all saw that monster put back dunk he had in the fourth quarter. And that's, what's fantastic about OB. It's not just how high he gets on his jumps, but how quickly he gets off the ground. Uh, That one in particular, if if you missed it for some reason, you missed the game for some reason, highly encourage you to go check it out on YouTube. I would say one of the more freakish displays of his athletic ability this entire season. Um, But those are are sort of the old Obi skills. That's the stuff that we saw at least bits and pieces of going back to last season. The new Obi skills are this, this ability to win 
in, I don't want to say win in isolation because he's still, he's obviously, he's not doing the mellow, right? He's not, he's not catching the ball in the wing, triple threat position, jab, jab, splash a jumper in your face or jab, jab, crossover between the legs, spin move to the rim. But we're seeing elements of that. And I, I hesitate to say it because it feels too lofty, but it sort of, it sort of does feel like we're starting to, he, he's, he's starting to have moments where it's like, oh, maybe he could be a source of offense in and of himself versus someone who has to benefit from the creation abilities of others. But I'll, I'll take you guys through some of the key plays uh, for Obi Toppin in this one, because there were, there were a lot of good ones. Um, second quarter, or might've been late first quarter. He uh, catches the ball in the corner, pump fake to get by Kessler Edwards. Um, LaMarcus Aldridge comes up to help. Edwards is still on his back. There's like a quick little crossover to get Aldridge on his hip and then just kind of drives his hip into LaMarcus Aldridge to dislodge uh, the NBA veteran and then just finishes with a layup at the rim. And we got we got this question. Um, I'm going to answer a bunch of you guys' question from Michael Shane. He said, despite his predicted NBA readiness, Obi was mostly disappointing on offense his rookie season. But is it possible he's even better right now than we thought he would be at this point during his second season? It's plays like this that make me kind of say, yeah. I mean, especially given just like like a, a big concern from him coming in that turned out to be significant was his lower body strength on both ends of the court. That was predicted to be a bigger issue defensively than it was offensively. I think it ended up being a bigger issue in offense where he just he just couldn't dislodge anyone around the basket. And that that is done a 180. He is he's a weapon. Lamarcus Aldridge is a stout dude, and Obi just kind of just just pushed him off his mark and got an easy layup. Um I've already mentioned his ability to run the floor hard. The shot blocking in this game was just ridiculous. Like rejected a Patty Mills layup late by getting up really quick. Um, ran with Bruce Brown in transition. And, and Bruce Brown has been a, a real weapon for the Nets in transition this year. Just pinned his shot on the backboard. Um, and then just just some more offensive creativity from Obi. Um, he had this little like, this, this didn't even turn into an assist, but it just stood out to me. Like caught the ball in midair past the three-point line, and as he caught it, faked a pass to the corner, um, and it just totally, I can't remember who was guarding him, but it, it spun the guy around, got into the lane, whipped a pass into the opposite corner uh, to Alec Burks for wide open three. Burks ended up missing it, but again, the process is so good, and it just, it, it, it's its almost Draymond Greeny, the way he he uses pass fakes and the way, I mean, he's just so smart, and, and it's just rare for a power forward in the NBA to be able to manipulate a defense like that, but Obi very much has that in his game. Uh, one final drive that really stood out to me um, off of an IQ dish um, that drew Kevin Durant to the rim. It led to Kevin Durant having a long closeout on Obi Toppin. Um, Obi just did this fake, like quick shuffle pass over to the wing. Um, and that beat like the help side closeout by Patty Mills. Then Katie met him at the rim. And then that's when the athleticism comes in to play the slick up and under. And, and to me, I mean, I guess to, to wrap up, this whole thought and to sort of um, summarize, uh, I think what Michael Shane was getting at um, it, it's OB. It's, it's a combination of his skill level improving with those little pass fakes, with the ability to take more than one or two dribbles and that unlocking his athleticism at the rim, because he, he's a guy who can finish creatively and with great touch, but that only matters so much if you can't consistently get to the rim. And we're seeing an OB top in now, that with that skill improvement, including a more consistent three-point shot of late that, that's leading to some long closeouts, he's able to get to the rim. Uh, one final play that I almost forgot about, fourth quarter, late shot clock. R.J. Barrett has the ball. No one's moving to bail him out. OB, basketball IQ, and just effort here, cuts across the lane, gives R.J. someone to pass it to, but then hits like this fadeaway, fallaway shot um, as he's hitting the ground at the shot clock buzzer from about 12 feet. I, again, that that is a shot, um, to Michael's point, that I just never, ever, ever could have imagined Obi Toppin having in his repertoire uh, a year ago. All right, we're going to come back, and I want to talk uh, R.J. Barrett a little bit, and I want to talk, uh, as you know, I got, I got to do it. It's it's, it's locked on next. Uh, some some coaching failures from Tibbs in this game that maybe led to the next downfall. Maybe not. We'll, we'll debate that next. But first, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. You can find all the latest sports development, including this week's Masters Championships odds, 
podcasts, and reviews for all the different leagues this season. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. MLB opening day is quickly approaching, and I think Alex and I uh, told you last pod, but I will reiterate it. Uh, I would I put some money down on Bet Online against the Knicks, uh, not the Knicks. I mean, always against the Knicks, but against the Yankees and the Mets. So head to the website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. And with that, we are back on the Locked On Knicks podcast. Uh, thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. Go check out uh, Locked On Giants if you're looking for a second. Listen, uh, I always forget because I get so wrapped up in basketball season, but the NFL draft is very quickly approaching. I, for one, am very curious to see what the Giants do with two top 10 picks. So if you haven't already, uh, certainly go check that out. Um, but let's let's continue talking Knicks. And um, I'll, I'll save RJ Barrett, actually, because I want to start off uh, going a little bigger picture because I thought this loss just had a lot of a lot of similar qualities to it um, that defined uh Past Knicks losses. Uh, I saw like uh, two two former great guests on this podcast, uh, Dallas Amico and Ariel Pacheco, uh, discussing this on Twitter. But just just the idea that the Knicks, um, again, sixty seven points in the first half, thirty one points, very ugly number in the second half. Just have this tendency to it's almost it's almost like a like a college basketball team, like like a mid major that's about to to pull up an ups pull off an upset. And then just gets really, really tight and says, all right, what are we going to do? We got to we gotta just pound the rock. We got to run the shot clock. And they stop doing the things that built them the lead in the first place. And to me, that that is sort of the defining sentence of this next season. They, 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 they overlook the things that they do well. And instead of just essentially like pounding home consistently the things that they're good at, they get away from them. And in turn, they don't play up to their talent and they lose. And that is true in terms of their play style. That is true in terms of their effort at points. That is very much true in terms of their rotations throughout the year and the guys that Tibbs decides to have on the court. The rotation thing wasn't as much of an issue this game. Uh, Manuel quickly got big minutes. Obi Toppin got big minutes. RJ Barrett obviously is consistently playing big minutes. Jericho Sims played a ton with Mitchell Robinson out. Not the issue in this one. The issue in this one was just the general stagnation. And the Knicks, um, again, the, they, they played this beautiful basketball. Uh, throughout the first and second quarter. I think Fred Katz tweeted out at one point they were outscoring the Nets 44 to 21. They went on a 19 to 0 run uh, between the first and second quarter. And they were they were playing with this great pace, even in the half court. Right? It, was, it was Obi Toppin running the floor hard, getting those early seals. It was Emmanuel quickly who wasn't shooting the ball well, um, just creating for everyone else. It was RJ Barrett consistently making the right reads and and, and playing, I thought, pretty darn unselfishly while also he finished this game very inefficiently because he just he kind of sucked throughout the second half, but consistently finding the open man um, and making these really just tough winning plays around the basket. Uh, it was Alec Burks, who I think finished the first half with 18 or 19 points, just raining fire from three, getting to the rim, but doing it all within the flow of the offense. And then the second half, Tibbs, it's like something clicked in his brain. He said, you know what? Burks is hot. Obi's hot. Let's generate some mismatches and just let them post up. And that is not those guys game. And I think it took the Knicks offense out of their rhythm. All of a sudden transition, they were throwing the ball away. They did so repeatedly to start the second quarter. Another big issue. This, this is not on Tibbs. This is just in and of itself. Uh, the free throw shooting was, was pretty, pretty horrendous. They finished the game 21 of 36 from the line. Obviously you shoot a little bit better from there. It's a very different ball game, but I guess the big picture thing I'm trying to get at is I think this is on Tibbs to a large extent and it's going to continue. He's not, I, I put this out on Twitter, but both in terms of his rotations and in terms of this lack of offensive creativity, he's not going to, he's not going to find religion in the off season to, to use an analogy, right? He, he needs to have religion forced on him by the Knicks hiring him an offensive coordinator or him losing his job and someone who is, is a little more qualified to run a modern NBA offense uh, comes on in to do just that. Um, but that doesn't seem like it's going to happen at this point. So ideally the Knicks would get an assistant coach would hand over that. I mean, that can, that can pull that off and that can keep this team in advantageous positions and can best leverage the talent they have on the offensive end of the floor. And that means a whole lot of creativity because the Knicks just, the Knicks do not have, the frontline talent to win playing isolation balls. There, there are teams in the NBA that can do that and have an immense amount of success doing so. 
you look at this Knicks roster, there was a lot of promising young players there, but they are not, they're not those guys. RJ Barrett is really the only person who is consistently that dude. And as we'll get into in a minute, he's one of the most inefficient players in the NBA at doing so. So given those factors, you need to offset that with a whole lot of off-ball movement. Uh, I mean, I, I think Dallas, I'd love to have on this podcast because the guy just knows way, way more about basketball than I do. Um, like he was noting, like, there's just like not a lot of like basic zone beaters that you'll see um, NBA teams run. I mean, you watch a Knicks game, you watch a Heat game. It just looks like different sports in terms of the sophistication of how they're playing offensively. Uh, all that being said, I think sometimes like people tend to be a little bit too harsh on Tibbs in this respect because I think some element of it is just that lack of talent. And it's the team playing a bit over their head in the first half. And that's defined by them playing with this just relentless, frenetic pace and energy. And that simply doesn't end up being sustainable over two halves of basketball. And eventually the talent on the other side, in this case, it was the Nets having Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, two hall of famers in the Knicks, just having no one close to that level. And, and, and I know you can, you can say both those things can be true. The Nets could have more talent and Tibbs didn't coach an ideal game offensively. Yeah, I agree with that. But I also just, I, I just think there's something to the idea that this team has had stretches of basketball where they play a little bit over their heads and then it's kind of regression to the mean and they come back to earth. And I, I, I don't know how much of that is on Tibbs versus just the general lack of talent. And, and, and again, that's not saying the Knicks don't have a lot of good players, but they do, but they're mostly really young and they're not quite stars, right? They're, they're a notch below that. So that, that's my thoughts on all that. Uh, very quickly, uh, before we wrap up the second segment, RJ Barrett, um, not an interesting night for RJ Barrett, right? Uh, highly inefficient once again, seven to 27 from the field, two for 11 from three. Seven for 12 from the foul line, did have 23 points, did have seven rebounds, did have seven assists. And the reason I say it was an interesting game is because I thought the first half was, even though he, again, not, not his best scoring half of the season, I thought it was one of the better halves of basketball he played this season. I mean, the dude just threw some absolutely sick passes. He's really, really mastered that, um, like, drive left, draw two, three defenders, whip a one-handed lefty bullet into the opposite corner. That, that's an all-star pass, right? That, that's, that, that, that's the pass that the best creators in the NBA make with a whole lot of consistency. And then just his, his propensity to, to keep the Knicks afloat in this game when they didn't have anything going, again, especially in that first half, not so much in the second half, but his, his, his um, consistency just forcing his way to the rim Um he had this nasty inside spin move on Kevin Durant um, and then just two steps straight to the basket to, to beat the buzzer in the first quarter. Just the in, instincts on display there, the gutsiness to go right at KD, the timing on the shot was just awesome, um, was taking advantage of LaMarcus Aldridge over and over again, like went right into his body for a double pump and one. Uh, the net sunk uh, repeatedly um, when he got the ball coming off the screen, going to three-point line, made them pay a couple times with a mid-range jumper. Them with the deep three um, had another, this might've been early third quarter, but there's a really nice little drop off to Sims for a dunk. Um, I'm so excited. I always get excited now seeing RJ like take a little dribble handoff, curling the opposite direction of the ball handler, because it feels like he scores just about every time he does that. And it's go, playing off guys who aren't really major threats to score. You insert again, hypothetical world, but you, you put a Donovan Mitchell in that spot who has a little bit more gravity and gives RJ a little bit more of an opening. I think that's where the efficiency can turn around from him. And that was, I mean, in line with uh, a question we got from uh, Tago uh, Campante. Uh, let me know if I'm, or excuse me, Tiago uh, Campante. Let me know if I'm getting that right, Tiago. Um, he said this season, uh, 24 players took at least 17 field goal attempts per game in the NBA. Among those, the two with the worst effective field goal percentage were Julius Randle and RJ. It doesn't make any sense to max two inefficient high usage players. And I think that question the question came to fruition a little bit more in the second half of this game um, because we, we got a little bit more of inefficient RJ in the second half of this game. And it, it was it was almost like foreboding because I think it was right out of halftime. Uh, Rebecca Harlow led into this clip of Steve Nash uh, complimenting um, RJ Barrett, but also saying, hey, like we're, we're not going to make anything easy on him. And RJ saying, yeah, you know, um, I, always, I always find it kind of challenging to go against Steve Nash and the Nets because he knows my game so well. 
and he feels like they have they have kind of the best scout on him in the NBA. And I thought that proved true in this game with Nash repeatedly baiting RJ into his worst tendencies, throwing extra defenders his way. And you saw it over and over again where RJ forced up these just absurdly tough layups in lieu of just kicking it out to Obi Top and wide open the corner, kicking it out to Emmanuel quickly, wide open um, at the wing, or just simply resetting the offense when he didn't have an advantage. And we've noted that a ton with RJ this year. It continues to be an issue for him. And it, it's sort of like, it's it's kind of a good thing. It's kind of a bad thing in, in terms of his efficiency because I think it's pretty easily correctable. And, and and a good note on that front is RJ, I think, has some real self-awareness about it. It's not it's not like Julius where, he, where he's where this, the subtext of everything he's saying is like, I'm playing my best. Everyone else needs to play better. Um, it's more so like, hey, I mean, he literally came out and said this after the game. Like, I could have made better reads throughout this game. I didn't do a great job. He had seven assists in this game. He should have had something like 13 assists in this game with the way the Nets were playing him. Um, but kind of a learning experience. And I, I don't, I'm not worried about maxing out RJ because of his efficiency. I think that's going to come up naturally as he gets older, as he continues to work on his game, as his touch around the rim continues to improve, as he continues to get stronger, as he continues to get more athletic, and maybe even more importantly, as his teammates and the coaching get better around him. I think, I think those are the factors that will drive up RJ Barrett's efficiency. He does so many things well. He's on such a good track. I'm not worried about maxing out R.J. Barrett. Julius Randle is a very different story, but we've had that conversation ad nauseum, so uh, we will have it again another day. Let's pick up um, with Jericho Sims because uh, with Mitchell Robinson out, he showed some real flashes in this game. I, I think everyone, or at least it's bur- it's seared into my head, the verticality he had, um, I'm pretty sure it was against Kevin Durant in the fourth quarter of the Knicks' last matchup with the Brooklyn Nets, where the Knicks almost pulled off that late victory. And that was that was one of the first, like, wow moments with Jericho Sims and saying that this dude, like, whatever his his faults are around the basket in terms of lack of aggressiveness at this point and still having to figure things out defensively, this dude is a bona fide NBA player. And you can, you can check out Benji Ritholt's tweet for this. He put out, like, the last 10 to 12 58th picks in the draft. Suffice it to say, it is not normal to get a bona fide NBA player um at the 58th pick in the draft and the Knicks I mean between him between the flashes that Emmanuel Quickly and Obi Toppin have shown of late given what Quentin Grimes looks like one of the better 25th picks at recent NBA memory again right there with Emmanuel Quickly um this Knicks front office clearly very very good at drafting and that in, in a season that has been tough that is a real win. Uh, but let's circle back on Sims because he showed even more flashes of those of that verticality in this game. Had back-to-back stops on Andre Drummond trying to go coast to coast in transition, just getting his body in the way. And that's an issue we've seen Mitchell Robinson have with like bigger, more physical players. And Drummond, whatever his faults are, he's sort of the epitome of that. Sims laid his body on the line to deflect that. And then just just comes back and still has the vigor to deflect the Kevin Durant shot. Again, go straight up and down. And not let Durant, one of one of the better guys in recent NBA history, of finishing around the basket, um, not letting Kevin Durant finish there. And then, I mean, he also combines that with this perimeter foot speed and sort of the same qualities that have defined Mitchell Robinson's success over the years. That ability to be a force around the rim and to get stops on the perimeter. And he he absolutely shut down Seth Curry on a switch at one point. Not not that Seth Curry is the most dynamic off the dribble guy in the NBA. I mean, Seth Curry got him a couple of times with, with pump fakes, like in, inducing flybys and draining threes. Uh, but just that that mobility combined with that rim protection. And, and then he has some real strength around the rim. And, and the big thing with Sims is continuing to improve his patience there because he had a play where he just absolutely dislodged Nick Claxton. And then he just, he kind of went to his pet move, which is a reverse pivot jump hook. And to me, that's very much a rookie thing. That's that's all right. I'm rushed. Um, I'm I'm a little bit nervous. Like I'm 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 playing this huge game against these Hall of Famers uh, with a with a stacked MSG. Let me just let me just go to what I'm comfortable with instead. If he takes another second there, he gets a layup. He gets a dunk. I think that's maybe the biggest quality that young bigs often have to learn in the NBA. It's that you don't have to rush everything. And even though the pace of the game is a little bit faster, the guys you're going at are a little bit more likely to block your shot. You can win by patience and guile to fully leverage your athletic ability. And to me, that's the next step for Jericho Sims. And I think um, Sims' big game got me thinking about another mailback question we got. Uh, this one was from Brian Burnside at Brian Burnside Music on Twitter. 
And he said, who has played their last game at Madison Square Garden, given that this was the next final home game of the year, unless I'm unless I'm having a real brain fart. Um, and I think the way Sims was playing tonight got me thinking a little bit about Mitchell Robinson as one of the answers to that question. That That's sort of just a gut instinct. I personally would, would like to see Mitch back. I think him and Sims playing all 48 minutes at center um, would be really, really good for this team and would honestly, like with a little bit of improved infrastructure outside of those two, would pretty much keep them as a top 10 defense in the NBA for the foreseeable future. Um, but I think Sims's emergence just makes him a little bit more disposable. And if a team like Detroit goes really crazy and offers him 17 to $18 million a year, I think the Knicks would feel that money is better spent on someone like Jalen Brunson. Uh, very quickly, other guys who I think have played their final game, Kemba Walker, Nerlens Noel, and I'm going to, I'm going to say Julius Randall, but maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any other real notes on other guys. Alec Burks again, spectacular first half, crummy second half. It's not on him. It's kind of, it's kind of on tips. He's, he's, he's being overtaxed. Like this game I thought was the story of Alec Burks' season. We're in, in, in the right role with the right amount of time, with the right amount of responsibility. He is, he is just a fantastic basketball player and fantastically fun to watch. You put too much on him and he breaks down as the game goes along. And he, he did, he did, he had nothing uh, trying to win this game for the next down the stretch. And that's not his fault because that's not his game. That's not who he is. That's never who he's been. And it's on Tom Thibodeau for thrusting that responsibility on a guy who just is not capable of handling it. And that's nothing against Alec Burks. Um, but yeah, final, final two questions uh, from you guys before we wrap up. I'll just read them out together because I think they're kind of linked. Ari at Obi-Wan Kenari um, wants to know, could, could it be that the front office hasn't forced Tibbs into inserting IQ as a starter because they know the offseason – they're either signing a starting point guard in Brunson or trading for one, maybe Malcolm Brogdon. So they don't care if he starts now or not. And then the question from Elsie Hunt at Elsie Hunt too, would signing Brunson be a mistake considering we already have quick plus deuce and need to start paying some of the younger guys, Mitch, RJ, Cam, et cetera. Um, trading Noel and Julius a priority now for cap health. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to look at that as like one big off season question about the point guard spot. Here's how I, here's how I view the dilemma. I think, I, I don't I don't buy the idea that the front office was was taking that into account in terms of whether or not they want to start quickly because you would still want a man who quickly to be developed as possible, even if he wasn't going to be your starting point guard next year. And the best way to develop a guy in the NBA is usually to play them uh, big minutes to, if they're ready for them. And Emmanuel quickly has shown that he is certainly ready for big minutes. So I don't think I don't think it was that. Um, in terms of what they're going to do this off season, um, I don't know. I don't think signing Jalen Brunson would be a mistake just because he's, I look, if you're paying him $25 million, then yeah, if you're paying him more like 18, 19, 20, nah, I mean, he's just, he's just, he's so, so efficient. I think to Alex's point the other day, maybe not for full games, but him and quickly can play together to some stretch. And the question, it, it's sort of an opportunity cost question. How else are you going to use that money? If you're the New York Knicks, because I think Jalen Brunson just with the type of player he is, will always be very tradable. And if you sign him and the, and the worst thing that happens is you move him the next deadline for a first round pick, not the end of the world. That's still, that's still a decent signing. If there's a perimeter player or like a particularly interesting stretch five that you could use, or if you could trade for someone like Brogdon, who is a much cleaner fit next to quickly just because of his size, then go ahead and do that. But if you don't have a better option, Jalen Brunson, you could do much worse. One, one of the most efficient scorers in the NBA at the point guard spot. And I think offensively, at least him and quickly would be extremely dynamic together. And defensively, again, you have a Mitchell Robinson, you have a Jericho Sims on the back line. Those two could certainly hold up. And I think you can still afford everyone, but to that point, you got to find a way to get off New Orleans Noel and Julius Randle. And I certainly think you could, maybe that's a two for one where you don't get anything back, but you trade Julius to get someone to take New Orleans contract and you get off both of them. I would be perfectly okay with that. I think Brunson is a much bigger priority for the Knicks than Julius Randle is or should be. But that is it for this edition of the Locked On Knicks podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, as always, we will be back. Um, well, not as always, but we will be back tomorrow uh, with more, uh, the second part of our April mailbag. But until then, uh, remember to throw us a subscription on YouTube. Remember to throw us a five-star review on iTunes. We have not been getting a lot of reviews recently, and we really, really appreciate them. If you have the time to do it, just takes a second. Uh, but until next time, I'm Gavin Shaw. Peace out.